Okay, we are live again at the Edlow Podcast. Hello, Dr. Massey. Hello. It is, it's so crazy to think that you're a doctor and I'm a lawyer and we've known each other since we were like 16. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, man. Yeah. That flies. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's 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 so crazy just to think. I mean, where where everybody ends up, and and here we are. We've we've connected over the years just because of what I do. I deal with a lot of pain management, uh, you know, doctors and and people with spine injuries. And you've gotten into spine injuries as a pain management doctor, and uh, so I'm glad to have you here. I educate our listeners on uh, on some of the issues in pain management because I'm sure that a lot of people don't even know what pain management is. So. Okay. Yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, good. So why don't we start? Tell me what got you, what got Mike Massey into going to med school? Uh, well, when I was 16, I had a big injury when uh, I was playing football and back injury, uh, got an MRI, went to an ortho doctor and he said, Mike, I'm sorry to tell you, you have a disc herniation. And I, at mm-hmm. the time, I didn't know what that means. Mm-hmm. And then he proceeded to tell me, and we need to do surgery on your back. And I looked at him and I said, that's just not happening, man. I'm 16, I'm still growing. What are you talking about? And he said, well, that's what we do. And I was like, okay, well, what else can I do? And he sent me to physical therapy. I tried doing uh, ibuprofen. I tried doing magnet therapy, uh, all these different types of alternative therapies. And I was actually really lucky. My uncle, he at the time was a pain management fellow at Stanford. And at the time, it was kind of like an emerging field and brand new medical specialty and talked to him about it. And he said, listen, man, don't have surgery unless you have weakness in your leg or something like that, which I didn't. And he said, you just got to wait it out, do rehab. It's going to take forever and eventually you'll slowly get better. And that's what happened. And that's kind of how I started initially getting interested, getting interested in pain medicine and um, experiencing firsthand what it's like to be a, a pain patient and kind of go through the whole process. Yeah. So what level of, uh, are you, is this in your lumbar spine? Yeah, it was a L4-5 uh, disc herniation. Oh, wow. Is it impinging on a nerve root? Yeah. Uh, I felt it going down my leg uh, when I'd be sitting in class or seminary or whatever, like I would just start feeling uh, my leg kind of go nuts and I would have to stand up, walk around. Um, You know, I mean, it was rough. I didn't know what was going on. And sometimes you can't really get a good position and you just, there's just nothing to do. You know, you just kind of have to tough it out. Yeah, that's the reason I ask is I have uh, an L5 S1. Uh, It's not quite a a herniation, Um, it's a protrusion. And so, um, but it impinges on a nerve root. And for a time I was getting the shooting pains down my legs and a little bit of numbness and tingling in my toes. It's not a fun feeling. That's (laughs) awful. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And so, uh, but I'll tell you, I'm a big proponent of pain management and not just because of what I do as an attorney, but because I've experienced it. And I am deathly afraid of needles, but I remember getting uh, an epidural steroid injection and it was like, no joke, life changing for me. Um, Yeah. It, it was crazy to me. And you don't really understand. Um, you really don't understand the significant pain you're in until it's gone. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And you realize how debilitating you, how debilitating it's been. And mm-hmm. so, so now um, when you going through this, so this is in like the, the mid to late nineties, then that you're going through this. Um, yeah. And, uh, and it was still an emerging field. So tell me like, what were the, what were the options back then? I mean, I, were, were epidurals and, and uh, you know, the facet injections and things like that, were that even available yet? Oh, yeah. So pain medicine came out. Uh, well, pain medicine is kind of like this old field. So it started like a long time ago, but became really popular with the advent of the MRI. And pain management doctors originally were anesthesiologists that were helping spine surgeons after patients would get spine surgeries. And they would just do things on patients that they did in the in the OR, you know, so they knew how to do blocks for Mm -hmm. surgeries and they just did it as an outpatient. And through that type of practice, it eventually developed into what pain medicine is today in terms of interventional pain medicine. So, yeah, shot um, epidural steroid injections have been around for a long time. Uh, Blocks have been around for a long time. 
But I'd say not until like the late 80s, 90s, did it start to really become part of a, an outpatient thing that you would do to patients with pain. In the okay. past, what they would do when people had disc herniations is they would just wait it out and mm. eventually it would get better or they'd have a drop foot or whatever. Mm. Wow. So um, tell me, what what is it that, uh, you, you know, as far as part of pain management as well is uh, medications and mm-hmm. uh, opioids. Um, and I know a lot of my, my clients when they've had these disc protrusions, herniations, they're very wary, especially if they have addiction in their families or things like that, they get really worried about the, of getting addicted to some of these opioids. And you hear all these stories of people with Vicodin and, and, um, and different ones like that. Tell me uh, what you think about the opioid, uh, opioid use. Sure. So the way I think about opioids is um, you have to know what they are, what they do, uh, the good, the bad, and you got to know the law, too. So uh, the good thing, the good things about opioids is, number one, it's an excellent analgesic. Um, I would challenge anybody to um, share with me a medicine that is better in terms of having an analgesic effect than an opioid. Um, there's all different types of target receptors in the body for opioids. So if one opioid doesn't work, you can do another opioid. Um, they don't harm organs. So they're not like other drugs. So things like NSAIDs um, mm-hmm. and acetaminophen, Tylenol, that could be actually really hard on your kidneys and your liver. And so there's certain patients that you really can't offer those analgesics to. And, you know, and Lately, they've been offering other types of analgesics for uh, patients where, you know, those medicines are contraindicated. It actually creates problems for them. And they're just kind of walking around suffering um, and, and there's issues. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, there there is a lot of good that can come from appropriate opioid um, medication uh, prescribing. Um, there's obviously a lot of bad that can happen. Uh, you know, you mentioned addiction. That's kind of a huge thing that's kind of popped up lately. Um, Another issue is just like, there's other side effects. So the constipation is a a side effect that never goes away. Um, It can have an impact on your immune system. Um, It can, uh, um, particularly hormones. So for example, if a man takes uh, opioids for years, they can end up getting osteoporosis, which is unheard of. You know, you usually don't see men with osteoporosis. That's typically something you see in old women. But yeah, I see a lot of guys that have been on opiates for a long time that um, end up getting it. And in the good old days, in the good old days, in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, there was a campaign in the United States um, where they called pain the fifth vital sign and doctors were instructed to prescribe opioids to patients. And if you didn't, you were a bad doctor. As a matter Mm. of fact, there's a lot of doctors that got sued for not doing that. And wow. then fast forward 20 years later, 2016, when the CDC guidance came out, it was the exact opposite. It was you're a bad doctor if you do prescribe opioids without certain conditions or reasons that were kind of laid out by the CDC primarily. What happened was the states kind of picked up on the CDC guidelines and kind of made their own statutes on how to prescribe opioids. And I'm just telling you right now, it's caused big problems um, to the Mm. point where they most recently um, revised the CDC guidelines that made it a little more more, um, um, less draconian to where you can actually work with patients one on one. Mm. Um, So, I mean, it's it's a it's a complicated mess to answer your question. I think opioid, you know, the whole opioid issue is a complicated mess. But I think that it's important to uh, remember that medicine is. Um, all about the person. It's personalized medicine that everybody's different. Everybody's circumstance is different. And you have to be able to, as a physician, be able to provide the best option with what's in front of you, as opposed to um, just kind of ignoring all option, any, any option like, like an opioid, if it's, if it might be indicated and just kind of say, sorry, you're, you're on your own. And one of the issues with that approach is, um, I'll give you an example. In Washington, they were very proud, and I trained in Washington, they were very proud of the decrease in opioid prescriptions kind of going down by providers. They are very proud of that. And they published that. And they showed that at all the conferences. But what they didn't show you is the inverse effect of um, 
illicit fentanyl and other opioids going up from the street. Mm, mm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, they were still getting it, but they were just getting it um, on the street. And that's actually caused a lot of overdoses. So it's a very complicated problem. Um, the FDA weighed in after the CDC guidelines came out on how to prescribe opioids and made it clear this isn't meant to be something to be used on the state level for statutes. This is something mm -hmm. to just kind of guide primary care doctors. So it's kind of a long winded answer, but like that's a, uh, well, yeah, but it sounds like it's super complicated. I mean, that, that's that's the thing, right? I, I, one thing that I think you you probably have to be trained in is seek is looking for drug seeking behaviors, right? I mean, that's one of the things that you have to look for. What, what are those drug seeking behaviors that you see if someone is addicted that you need to kind of be looking out for? Sure. So we always have to be mindful of uh, misprescribing, and um, another one. Um, willful blindness so we think all about all the time of willful blindness so willful blindness means if somebody presents and let's say they're out of you know they're, they're out of opioids they're out, out of their percocet or whatever and they shouldn't be they should have maybe 20 pills left that means they're taking more and uh we gotta ask well where where are they man you know like, oh i don't know i i lost them or something well, we also monitor patients with urine drug screens to make sure that the medicines that should be in their body are in their body and that's very important because we worry about uh, drug seeking behaviors, like you said. So often people who suffer from addiction and substance use disorder, they'll have not just opioids, but other substances in their urine. And so we monitor that uh, routinely. We do random drug screens. And this is all about safety for the patient to make sure that we are mindful of what's going on in and out of their body. Um, we counsel them all the time to consider uh, tapering going down on their opioids or even trying to taper off. Um, there's less addictive medications that we offer. One of them is called buprenorphine. That's kind of the main one. It's also mm -hmm. known as Suboxone. That's something that uh, patients can, for example, if somebody's been on opioids for years, often you can transition them to Suboxone. And that's an opioid that doesn't really have as big of an effect um, on the body. You can't really overdose on Suboxone compared to other drugs, compared to other mm. opioids. And it makes them feel normal. Um, mm. So that's been, a, that's been a pretty good, I, that's actually a great drug. Buprenorphine is a great drug. Um, and uh, I've seen a lot of people that have been on opioids that can't sleep. They have a brain fog. They get on Suboxone or Buprenorphine and they tell me, Dr. Massey, it's the first time I felt normal in a really long time. And so that's really good for patients that just can't taper off of mm. opioids. Mm. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Now, as far as um, uh, you know, pain management, it's, it's interesting. I, I often talk to my clients about the chronology of care, going from the most conservative to the most invasive as far as treatment goes. And it seems like pain management tends to be the last stop before you go and see a surgeon. How many, what percentage of patients do you think um, who have spine injuries end up in pain management? Um, it depends on what system you're working in. In my last system, they'd see us pretty quick and I prefer they see us quick because often uh, the, way, the way patients end up, whether it's surgery or PT or whatever, has everything to do with the messaging. So when I see patients, when I tell them if they have back pain is, Listen, 90% of anybody who has back pain gets better, no matter how bad it feels, no matter what's going on, almost everybody gets better with just physical therapy, chiropractic care, maybe a shot or some meds here or there, but most people don't get surgery because often people come in and they, and they say, it hurts so bad, man. I want to go to the hospital. I can't sleep. I can't do anything. I, I need surgery. And often um, that's not the right thing for them to have. And so you kind of have to talk them down a little bit and coach them up to just start doing the right thing. So go into physical therapy, um, maybe have um, some analgesics to help for sleep and pain. Opioids is kind of like something we use down the line. We usually don't, we usually don't pull out the heavy hitters just for somebody with back pain, more like just Tylenol arthritis, um, maybe some amitriptyline, that kind of thing. But uh, I, most people that I see, I'd say, I, I, in my last system, I'd see people all the time that had back pain because often the primary care provider just didn't want to manage it. They just wanted them mm -hmm. to get them off their plate, come see me. And I would, you know, send them to PT for like six weeks, come back. And then, you know, usually the sweet spot for whether someone is surgical or if they want an injection is like six to 12 weeks after 
somebody has a, uh, um, acute low back pain. Sure. So when you, um, how long would you say, um, pain has to be there before you consider it chronic? Um, usually after, usually like three to six months, mm -hmm. I think everybody would agree that six months is probably something that most people would agree would be chronic at that point. Right. So, and maybe you can explain to we're, we're talking like an, a lawyer and a doctor here. We know, <laughs> like we, we know all the terms. So for somebody who doesn't know, what do you mean by acute versus chronic? Sure. So acute pain is usually pain that presents after an injury, after you have some sort of um, painful stimuli, whether it's a broken bone or maybe you get a cut or something like that, or um, you strain your back, that kind of thing. Most of the time, acute pain, pain goes away when the injury heals. And so, you know, after you strain your back, you know, maybe in the gym or something, that usually gets better no matter what you do after like four weeks, six weeks. Um, chronic pain is pain that's there, but it really shouldn't be. And after the tissues have healed, people still have pain. And the treatment for chronic pain is a little bit different than um, acute pain. So acute pain is all about removing the, whatever is causing the issue. So if you have a herniated disc, if we do, you know, a surgery on the disc that's pinching a nerve, then that should help the pain going down your leg, that kind of thing. Um, with chronic pain, and let's say if someone has pain shooting down their leg and it's been six months, 12 months, whatever, we really get into other modalities of treatment emphasize them. So it's all about like um, physical therapy, having healthy lifestyles, making sure you sleep right, making sure you eat right, and doing the things that you need to do in order to um, have a sweet life. Just making sure that you, you go to work, you are there for your kids, um, your family, you're able to sleep, you're able to not be grumpy all the time, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so it's, it's a little bit different. And sometimes it gets a little bit more into uh, the psychological, emotional state, and we would prescribe antidepressants and anxiety medications because, you know, if you can't do the things that you used to be able to do because of pain, you, you're going to get depressed. That's just that's just something that's going to happen. So we might try um, seeing a psychologist. We might just try to talk them up or have them do things that you know helps their mood or or stress issues, but. Um, there are a lot of meds that have been very good for um, people that suffer from chronic pain and also have depression or anxiety. Yeah, it's actually really uh, interesting, the connection between physical health and mental health, even like just being able to go to the gym, you know, is is so helpful for your mental health state. And I can remember, you know, I, I was a big basketball player and I would have my back injury. I couldn't play for a really long time. And it was so interesting after getting that injection. I, it took me a while to get one. I was probably nine months to a year, you know, before I was able to get the injection going. And when I got it, uh, man, I just wanted to run everywhere because I didn't have pain. You know what I mean? It was just, it was so yeah. nice. And so, um, so now also, by the way, going back, could you imagine if you would have actually gotten a surgery at 16? I mean, Oh, I'm so happy that I, had the arrogance to tell the orthopedic surgeon, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not getting a surgery, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I mean, and there's one thing I'd say is that, um, to anybody who's kind of thinking about that is, um, don't assume that somebody knows more than you if, um, you know, if you're making a big decision. So anybody making a big decision on surgery or whatever, you got to get the pros and cons, talk to people you trust. I talked to my uncle about it too. And mm -hmm. told him what he told me because he told me there'd be no long term implications, no term long term consequences. And I was like, "Is that right?" I asked my yeah. uncle that, and he's and he's like, "That guy's lying to you, man." We yeah. talking about you'll have another surgery in like five years, you know? Yeah, so, on, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? I mean, we're seeing, you know, in my case is when someone is a younger patient. When I say younger, I mean less than forty, you know, in their thirties, and they end up with a with a back surgery. They're almost certainly just because of adjacent level syndrome are going to end up having a second surgery in their lifetime, at least, if not a third. And so yeah, that alone, likely. yeah, that alone, I mean, that was one of the things they were talking about with me was getting surgery and, and getting the injections um, were really what saved me from having to do that, you know? Yeah. Um, 
And so, so now talking about, you, you mentioned you were trained in Washington. Is that right? Yeah. So I did my residency in physical medicine and rehab in Chicago. And I trained in, I did a, excuse me, a fellowship in pain medicine in uh, Seattle at the University of Washington. Hmm. How is it? In, so being in Seattle, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of drugs in Seattle, things of that nature. Tell, tell me what it was like doing pain management in Seattle. Uh, yeah, quick story. So we got there, we lived probably about uh, eight blocks from Pike's Market, if you've ever been to Seattle. And um, we were walking around in Belltown, which is pretty close by. And I was looking at these people walking around and I was telling my wife, Hera, Hera, these guys are on drugs, you, you know? And yeah. she's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Don't, no, what, why are you judging people? And I'm like, no, I'm just telling you, these people are on drugs. I know what people <laughs> yeah. on drugs look like. You know? yeah. and, they, and there's tons of drugs in Seattle, you know? And so it's, it was, it was very, um, it was good training ground because one of the things that I did is, I would see a patient that was just on a boatload of meds, a boatload of opioids. Maybe they had addiction issues and work with them on how to start peeling away, taking away medicine so that way they could still function. And um, I was very proud, actually, of some of the um, approaches I took to get people off of opioids. And um, um, what's interesting when you do that is people actually feel better when they mm. get off opioids. And so mm. that was good. Uh, the whole specialty of pain medicine actually started in Seattle and mm. with this guy named Bonica and you'd actually probably like him. So John Bonica, <laughs> he was, um, he was a wrestler. He oh, was nice. into like, he was into like wrestling. Mm. Um, and, uh, he was this anesthesiologist that started multidisciplinary care. And they have these old flyers of this guy doing multidisciplinary care and pain clinics. That's where, multidisciplinary care kind of came from for pain medicine. And, um, you know, that's, that was so, so they're very proud of that there with about John Bonica and, and his legacy. So mm -hmm. we kind of had that and had a lot of the, the um, faculty that wrote some of the seminal papers in pain medicine teach us about it and how they kind of landed on certain approaches to pain. Um, and, uh, you know, Seattle was, so great. It was great. Like I, I had a really good time with my colleagues there, um, met a lot of good friends, the fellows that I, um, you know, were there with, uh, we're still buds, you know, and, um, you know, I don't think it could have been any better training for me personally. Nice. And then, so you mentioned you did your residence, you did your fellowship in Seattle, but your residency in Chicago, right? That's uh, correct. Yeah. And then you ended up, I think if I remember correctly, you ended up first working in Minnesota. Is that right? Right. So after um, fellowship, I had um, kind of an offer I couldn't refuse and took it, took it in uh, Minnesota. And I, I never thought in a million years that my wife and I would land in Minnesota. But they um, they asked me to start a pain service line in a large health a large healthcare system called Centricare. Mm -hmm. At the time, I think they had eight hospitals and 30 clinics and they wanted me to you know start a service line. And I thought that would be great to to do that, to kind of learn how hospitals work, how systems work, um, learn how to hire people and what's important in a clinic. And, um, you know, basically just, um, just build it all out. It, it was a lot of fun, uh, actually handpicking the team as opposed to just walking into a team. Um, you know, they were all somebody I picked, so I knew what I wanted and I really appreciated that and, you know, did that for, um, you know, five years and we, my wife's from Florida and her family's from Florida. And so it kind of got the itch to come back to Florida. And so once it got, we always knew it'd be about five years. And after, you know, five years, uh, I knew if I left, it wasn't, it was in good hands. It wasn't just gonna like fall apart. And um, sure. so left, I mean, we had a multidisciplinary clinic. We had a pharmacist, we had a physical therapist, um, hired a physician, had a you know, nurse practitioners. And um, it was great. So I really enjoyed um, doing that and working with the team because we really practice team based medicine. And in my opinion, that's the that's the best way to go when it comes to patients with complicated pain issues. Nice. So um, and, and while we're talking about this, perhaps you could talk about what a residency or a fellowship is for purposes of what you do. Sure. So when you graduate from medical school, well, let me back up. 
while you're in medical school, around the third year, you have to decide what type of specialty you want to practice when you graduate. And I wanted to do uh, physical medicine and rehab. They're kind of they're they're kind of um, thought of as non-surgical orthopedic physicians. And we what they do is they see um, patients that have had injuries and they helped rehab them in a, in a hospital in an acute care hospital and they also have subspecialties like, like pain medicine sports medicine where they can focus on those issues um so i decided i wanted to do pm and r and when you do that you have to apply and you get interviewed by certain institutions and you um you put your name into a a, a system where you have to match into a place and so you have to rank every single um place where you went and and then hopefully you match and at the time unfortunately i didn't match and um it kind of blew my mind honestly that i didn't match mm -hmm. and so i had to do what's called at the time i think it's different now but at the time it was called a scramble and i reached out to um one place in Chicago called Schwab Rehab Hospital. And it was affiliated with um, the University of Chicago. And when I went there, um, I got along very well with the um, with the director. Her name is Dr. Gittler. And I, th I think the world of her. I feel like she's the best thing that could have happened to me as far as my training goes. Um, and we, I kind of, you know, she asked me, hey, you didn't match. What, you know, what, what about that? And, and I said, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure you're pretty because she did because she didn't fill her slot. So technically she didn't match either. And I, th and I, and I said, well, you know, I mean, yeah, I didn't match. And it, it kind of blew my mind. It did blow my mind that I didn't match. And I'm sure it blows your mind that you didn't match either. You know, so I just feel like this <laughs> day, you know, and so, yeah. like, and so um, she kind of like that. And, and, I, and I and I do have to kind of say my, my wife, she had a <laughs> she she and she and i talked a lot about like what to say in these interviews and right. she was uh, very helpful in um you know in, in, in helping me see the board on what to say on these types of scenarios but anyways it worked out really well um and uh got you know went through the training there at uh, in chicago and um when i applied for um for University of Washington, um, they, they do a match for that as well with fellowships and um, matched on that one. So I was very happy on that with that. With that. Yeah. So, um, didn't have to scramble with the fellowship. So nice. Yeah. And, and how many uh, pain management doctors end up going through to a fellowship? Like how many fellows are there at University of Washington in your sub subspecialty? Uh, we had five. We had okay. five fellows. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I don't I don't know what the numbers are of the people that come out and go to um mm -hmm. into pain fellowship but but it's a it's a hot it's a hot specialty and so a lot mm -hmm. of people will try to get into that afterwards and not everybody gets into a fellowship and they what they do is they go to like a, they might do a fellowship that's um, not accredited and they'll learn the procedures and you know they a lot of them are still very competent but they're just not board certified mm -hmm. and what do you, what does board certified mean because you're triple board certified right yeah, so I'm board certified in uh, physical medicine, rehab, uh, pain medicine, and brain injury medicine. And it's certified by the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehab. Um, what that means is that uh, the standards of care that I provide are monitored and that anybody who sees me can expect that I'll um, be practicing at the highest standards so according to um, the American Board of pm &R. And so we have ethical standards, we have practice standards, and it's just to help give people confidence that um, the care they're giving is what they need. Mm. So now you end up in Florida, was that, that's where you wanted to go, and tell us what you're doing now. So right now, um, I've been working with a group, I'm the medical director of Tampa Bay Orthopedic Surgery Group, and I am actually, we're, we're going to kind of have more of a collaborative relationship. I'm going to, I'm starting developing a pain management service line of clinics called Gulf Coast Pain Care. Um, still in the development phase of that, but um, we're, we're building, I have clinic space and we're remodeling right now. And the plan is to uh, build clinics up and down the Gulf Coast from, um, I live in Dunedin, it's around Clearwater in Florida, kind of just up 
Clearwater and a little bit south of Clearwater towards the St. Pete Petersburg area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, that's the clinics piece. And I also have a company called Med LCP. It stands for uh, medical life care planning. And we provide uh, life care plans for um, attorneys and anybody else that uh, might need a life care plan. Mm -hmm. And tell me uh, what a life care, well, I know what a life care plan is, but why don't you tell, why don't you tell the, the people who are listening what you mean by life care plan? Sure. So um, a life care plan is a document that's used to, um, and well, in personal injury, it's used to kind of go over what happened after an injury to a patient or a subject. And um, we draft kind of like a chronology of what happened. And then I'll do a, uh, an exam on the, on the uh, subject, or we'll do a virtual exam. And after that, we uh, determine what the future medical requirements are for that injured individual. Um, and once we determine the future medical requirements, then we cost it out for, um, for how long they'll need those future medical requirements. So it's uh, used by attorneys to determine uh, medical damages. Hmm. So, you know, here's one thing that I run into with my clients that I think is really interesting. <clears throat> a lot of them, uh, when they get to a pain management doctor like you, they are very scared of the notion of getting an injection. You know, they're, they're scared of the idea. I mean, they hear epidural steroid injection and they're thinking of epidurals like pregnancy epidurals. I mean, they're putting a, a giant needle in your spine and that is what they're doing. You know, that's what, that is what you do. And that's very scary. Um, perhaps you can, you can educate the listeners on what some of these injections are, what they treat, and how they help. Sure. So when uh, when a patient has a herniated disc and and so you know like you, if it's pinching a nerve and it's kind of going down the leg, and it's just not getting better with physical therapy or you waited a little bit, it's just not getting better. Um, an epidural steroid injection is a procedure where we put medicine above the dura, just the, kind of above the the uh, membrane of the spinal cord. And it goes to the uh, kind of around the nerve and around the disc where there was a herniation. And the whole point is to help decrease inflammation and help with pain. Um, it's not a big deal. It takes about <laughs> five minutes. Um, uh, the way I tell patients is it's a pinch and a burn. After that, you're going to feel a little bit of pressure. And then when I inject the medicine, you might feel a little bit of warmth go down their leg. Everybody's freaked out. Um, everybody gets very anxious the first time they do it. And then most of the time after we do it, they're like, oh, that's it. Like, yeah, that's it. Good job. Mm -hmm. See you later. Yeah. You know? And yeah, when I, when my clients come in and they're, they're, you know, if they're nervous about getting one, I explain my experience and I was, so listen, nobody's more afraid of needles than me. And I was like, and, uh, the, 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 um, anesthetic was, that that injection hurt more than the actual epidural steroid injection because you're numbed up you don't feel it you know right um and uh, uh so so tell us you know what what is it that you're hoping to achieve through an epidural steroid injection so from my standpoint i'm hoping to uh facilitate better rehab so often what pain does is it limits rehab so if patients mm -hmm. can't do certain exercises or walk that's a problem um, because other problems start to pop up. So if somebody's not moving or walking, they're going to start to get atrophy of muscles and that's going to cause uh, or help facilitate chronic pain that we're mentioning earlier. And so from my perspective, it's important to make sure you're moving. That's kind of, that's the whole game is moving. Mm -hmm. And epidural steroid injections are very good at facilitating that. And steroids usually last, the effects of steroids for pain usually last about three months. But I have patients that, and I've had enough of them, that would just swear on their life that it lasts like a year, you know? And uh -huh. so from my perspective, um, I mean, I have plenty of patients that get their annual epidural steroid injection and they just uh -huh. cruise on that and they're they're fine, you know? And yeah. I have other patients that might need it a little bit uh, sooner, you know? Um, you know, we try not to do too many because we become mindful of the effect of steroids. They can, uh, you know, make your bones soft and they can have an effect on your hormones and so we try to limit it to no more than like three to four a year if you're doing more than that then you're, you're probably getting too many 
Yeah, you know, and it's 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 interesting because that I've described it again to some people who who asked me about it. Is I said, listen, you know, I did the I had to do two of them. Uh, I got about I got a, a closer to like six months of for mine, uh, maybe four and a half to five. It started wearing off, and then about six, I needed to go in, and I got the second one. But in the in the course of that time, because the pain went away, I was able to do more aggressive physical therapy. I was able to start getting back in the gym, lifting weights, kind of strengthening the muscles around where it was so that when that second one wore off, I just didn't need to go and get a third, you know? Yep. And, and it was really a, a lucky, a lucky situation. Cause I know I have a lot of clients who, you know, they're going in multiple years, uh, getting them twice a year, you know, and, uh, and they're getting great effects. Some people aren't getting as good. I mean, some get 50%, some get 75%. Me, it was like, it was like 90. I mean, I got like major, major, um, uh, pain relief from, yeah. from it. I was really shocked. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think that, that those, I swear by them because I just, I had such great, I had such great success with them. Um, now, as far as uh, another injection that I know that a lot of people get are facet injections. Uh, perhaps you could talk about what a facet is. And here's what's interesting before you get into what the injection is. Perhaps you can explain also one thing that's interesting is that it, that you can't really see a facet injury on an MRI, right? Is that right? Sometimes you can. Okay. But but often you can't, to your point. Yeah. Like often you can't see a facet injury. And so, you know, whenever we um, try to evaluate someone for a facet injury, um, you know, it's just like any patient. You do a, a complete history of what happened. So, you know, in your world, if somebody got in a car accident, I'll see a lot, I see a lot of patients that, you know, had the whiplash or something like that. And they have, you know, right where their neck meets their upper back, there's, there's issues there. And they've done the chiropractic care or the, you know, the physical therapy, something like that. And it's just not any better. And when you kind of palpate right on their spine in that area, they're like, yeah, man, that hurts. And when I lean my head back, that hurts. Um, so facets are the small joints that are on, on your neck and your spine. And when I say spine, that spine means the bones in your in your neck and back. That's what that's what a spine is. It's not the spinal cord. It's just the, the bones and the facets are you have really small joints that kind of come together. And it's a very common place to have injuries when people um, like if somebody came in and they had the whiplash or something like that, if we wanted to test to see if the facets are um, causing pain, or mediating the pain, what we would do is something called uh, medial branch blocks. And that's um, what that means is we're injecting nerves that go to certain facets to see if that's the, the pain generator of where somebody is, is having pain. And so I will often uh, explore uh, if somebody has facet mediated pain, if they're just not getting better with uh, chiropractic care or physical therapy. And often uh, people get awesome relief with the with the medial branch block, um, that's called a, that's actually a diagnostic injection. It's not meant to last forever and really just to see if they get pain relief. So once you do it, they go about their day and if they're like, oh yeah, man, the pain's gone. And then when the medicine wears off, kind of like when the dentist thumbs your tooth, you're like, oh, and, uh, and yeah. the pain comes back. And often we'll do a procedure called um, radio frequency ablation or radio frequency neurotomy. And that's where we basically uh, buzz those nerves, put the needle in the same spot, only the tips heat up and, hmm. and it burns the nerves. And people usually get about six to 18 months relief um, if they get a solid uh, block that work. And, um, you know, I'd say on average, it lasts about a year. Hmm. Man, those radio frequency ablations, though, those are those are pretty rough procedures, aren't they? I mean, they, they, they kind of, I've seen some of them and they look, they look pretty gnarly. <laughs> well, yeah, they're not fun, you know. Yeah. Um, I'd say that the experience for whoever gets them probably has a lot to do with who does them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've seen yeah. some guys that are kind of brutal when they do them. And obviously the patient was like, oh. Um, right. But, I mean, you know, if you if you – if you do it the right way, it's it's not any worse, I don't think, than actually getting a – Medial branch block. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I, I don't know if you have one. Do you have a good story of someone who came to you just, just uh, really in a bad way, and uh, you saw a lot of success with their treatment? 
Yeah. I mean, um, there was this one guy that got hit by recently, he got hit by a car while riding a bike. And um, he was messed up, man. He had a compound fracture in his uh, in his leg, meaning his bone was sticking out of the skin. Um, mm. He had um, back pain, neck pain, like the whole nine yards. And so they went ahead and they um, fixed his leg. He still had pain there. And he saw me for his back stuff. And we, you know, he, he saw me probably like, six eight months after his injury original injury and and he was messed up and so we kind of went through um doing some uh interventional pain procedures we did end up doing medial branch blocks and um radio frequency ablation um and he he had some really good success with that and um he actually had complex regional pain syndrome as well in his foot um after the um after he got um, hit by the car and um he had some nerve damage there and um we i mean we just did some topicals for that and we did some rehab and he's he's managed it pretty well the case closed so i haven't seen him again but um that was the that was a good one you know in that in yeah that. yeah that's awesome it's always great when you see some of these people i remember hearing one person talk about a pain management doctor here in the area and it said when they first met him they they've been seeing him for 14 years when they first met him, they were in a wheelchair. And by the time they were done, they were able to ride roller coasters. And I think that's pretty remarkable. Voiding surgery completely. You know, just- I'll give you one. I saw this other guy. So there's this guy named John in, uh, this is in Minnesota. And um, he was on like all this Oxycontin, all, he had like a fentanyl patch. She had all these opioids that he was on and, and he was in a wheelchair. He was just kind of, mm. you know, in the wheelchair mm. coming in, wife's getting the door for him. And he was messed up. And I, we saw him and we said, John, we want to get you off of these opioid medications and onto buprenorphine. We, we think that's going to help you feel better. And he was a little bit skeptical, but we were like, John, we think this is the answer for you. And um, we ended up doing that. We put him on a buprenorphine formulation called Belbuca. And that's a little slip that goes into, the, into your cheek. And... Um, after about two weeks, three, three weeks, it was pretty dramatic. Kind of similar. You were saying he was, chair was gone. Um, he was getting the door for his wife. Um, he, what he did is he restored boats and he started like restoring boats again in his shop. Um, wow. it was such a successful story. We ended up making a commercial about it in our, wow. for our system, you know, and, um, it was, um, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, how just managing the meds, right had made such a big difference yeah wow that's amazing so so now you uh you're board certified in uh brain injury management is that right uh brain injury medicine yes brain management. so so tell me about that tell me what the how, how that came into be a part of your practice sure so i would see a lot of patients for just headache issues and mm -hmm. Often it wouldn't be just headache. Often they would have these uh, cognitive impairments, things like uh, memory loss. Maybe they weren't as sharp. They'd have word finding difficulties. They'd be dizzy. Their sleep was off. The whole thing after getting hit in the head or something like that. I've actually been seeing a lot of NFL athletes lately that have, that have cognitive impairments and headache issues, and where I'm at now. And it's just got to the point where um, I felt like I needed to get. Um, trained and certified um, to manage it because I was, I've been doing that. And so um, I went ahead and got board certified in brain injury medicine. And I primarily focus on um, concussion and mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, you know, in my, in my uh, residency, I did severe traumatic brain injuries, but in the, I, I typically don't see them in this context. It's usually mild to moderate. And I really just and very mindful of what kind of impairments are in front of me. And some of the most common ones that pop up are just dizziness and attention difficulties, that kind of thing. And um, knowing how to manage that. Most pain management docs, when they when they see patients like that for headache, they, all they want to do is just an injection. You do like occipital nerve blocks right here to kind of help with headache or something like that. 
they don't really, they're not really interested in addressing the cognitive issues and, and taking care of the person, you know? So, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll still do those injections, but I definitely want to make sure that they get what they need to kind of help manage everything else that's going on in their life. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, it's funny you call it a mild traumatic brain injury. I can tell you from my own personal experience and having a concussion and then also just seeing some of my, my clients, there's nothing mild about it. In fact, in some ways I would even argue that it's worse because you know, some of these people who are severe, uh, sometimes they don't even really recognize that they, that they have an issue. But when you're, when it's mild and you can feel the difference, you can see it, you can, you can notice that you're not as sharp. You can notice that you're having difficulties with attention or you're having a, maybe a, a, a impulse control issues or some, something like that. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it really triggers some of that mental health stuff that we, you were talking about earlier because, you know, I can just tell you from my experience, it was really interesting. I, I got in my a car accident. It was in 2018. Uh, hit the back of my head on the, on the headrest after I got rear-ended and pushed into a car in front of me. And uh, and uh, from there, um, you know, I was I was just off. Uh, couldn't I was having word finding issues. I couldn't speak. You know, I couldn't formulate sentences. It was pretty bad at the very beginning, and then slowly over time, it came back. But, um, but yeah, just, just sitting there and, and realizing that you can't go as fast as you wanted to, and you can't f- speak the way you wanted to, you can't, you know, you'll go to the garage and forget where you went. Uh, it, it, it can really scare you. It can really be a problem. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, man, that's scary. Yeah, it, it was, <laughs> it was, especially being an attorney where like I use my brain all the time. Right. Well, that's what it's, I mean. It affects your livelihood. Yeah. I mean, I remember it's actually really interesting. You know, I, I went into a neurologist and uh, um, it, it, this was I won't name what system, but it, I wasn't I wasn't a fan. And uh, I went in and the the neurologist said to me, he goes, you know, I got to tell you, uh, you might want to brace for the fact that you may never be able to be an attorney again. And I remember being like, what? You know what I mean? And and uh, and luckily I got out of that system and I moved on to another one. And, uh, and, and then when I moved on to the other one, I got into some speech therapy and, you know, a different neurologist who was really focusing on, you know, and and eventually it it got better, but it was, uh, it was really interesting. Another thing that I think is really interesting that I heard was they said, the people who believe that they are going to get better are more likely to get better than those who don't. Have you noticed that yourself? Well, yeah. Imagine if you listen to that guy. Yeah. yeah, whoever it was, you know, and he said, oh, I can't be an attorney anymore. OK, I guess I'll do something else. You know, it's it's like, you know, one of the things I get really upset about is um, the messaging that patients get from the doctors or whatever provider they see, because I don't think that um, providers or, or physicians really appreciate how much of an impact that has on certain people. Mm-hmm. Um they might actually listen to you if you have bad advice, you know, yeah. you know, they might actually just, you know, okay, I'm not going to do this job anymore. I'm going to go get on disability or something, you know, as opposed to rehab it and fight through it. So now I appreciate you saying that, um, um, uh, you know, if you, <laughs> the, the patient's mindset is huge. So in, in rehab, I'd see people all the time that were fighters, you know, and they would, want to fight and uh, not be disabled. And a good cohort of patients for that are actually um, amputee patients. So if you talk to most amputee patients, they don't consider themselves disabled at all. Um, mm-hmm. They, matter of fact, they get kind of pissed off if you if you kind of infer that. Not everybody, but most of them mm-hmm. can do everything. Like I'd see, I saw this one guy that had two legs cut off just below the, his knee. When I saw him in clinic, he came in on knee pads, okay? And what that guy did for a job, he climbed ladders and watched and washed windows. Okay. And so wow. I'm like, how do you do that? He's like, I figured it out. I was like, okay, good for you, man. You know, <laughs> and I think in a million years, this guy with, with uh, no legs would climb ladders and wash windows. It kind of blew my mind, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, but you know, anybody who would like look at that guy or somebody with certain types of impairments or um, spinal cord injury or whatever, a lot of people would just kind of assume, oh, well, they're hosts. They can't, they can't do, you know, anything, you know, they, they, they just, they, what, you know, what's their worth kind of thing. But I, I'll, I'll tell you, I've seen tons of people that have had strokes, spinal cord injuries, even traumatic brain injuries, and they are high functioning individuals that um, 
have a lot of worth in society. And, and uh, you know, that's, it's actually pretty inspiring to see that and, um, and just how their, their mindset is. Um, and I always try to put those patients in front of other patients that are struggling. So that way they can um, help them out a little bit and coach them up on, Hey, Hey, look, man, I don't have, uh, I have a spinal cord injury, but I'm still, I still have a sweet job. I'm still doing this. You know, I'm still active. I have a girlfriend or whatever. And, um, life's good, you know? And so, and they really need that. They need their peers to speak up and to help them out. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you how, how valuable it was to have uh, a positive mindset. I don't know. I, you know, there was a, a point in time, uh, pr- pretty much around my 38th birthday, because during that time also, you know, I mean, I'd been sitting at home, uh, for a few months. And I mean, and also, you know, I was eating a lot of junk food and do all that. I got, I got pretty heavy. And, uh, I remember on my 38th birthday going, you know what, let's see if I can get in the best shape I, I could get by 40. Right. And I just started eating right. And then started working out doing that stuff. And it was so crazy how the, how just doing those certain things changed into more of a positive mindset. That's really stuck with me since then. Uh, for these last four years, which was super helpful, especially during the time. So that's great, man. I mean, um, by the way, I've seen that, man. I, I, I'm glad that you post it because mm-hmm. it's great to see that um, you mean it, you know, and you live it. It's great, you know. Um, you've obviously um, you filled out, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's some muscles, yeah. man. Yeah, so, yeah, but, yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, I, you know, with the wrestling stuff, I. It, it actually, I get annoyed because I'm like, man, if I would have really, because like, dude, I mean, you know what it was like when we were in our 20s. You know, you could go to the gym two, three times a week and eat whatever you want and it looked, and you and you looked fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and I just thought, man, if I had this discipline back when I was 21, I'd be a monster. You know what I mean? Right. And I just, and so, but you know what, what can you do now? You just, you do, you do with what you can. And now it's cool to see, like, I have a 16 year old son and it's cool to see him. He has now started to, Hey, put together a, a workout regimen for me. Get me, you know, tell me what I need to do. Spot me here. And he's starting to see some results too. And so it's kind of cool to see the ripple effect, you know, yeah. and it's helpful. Like I can tell you for me, you know, you mentioned posting. Sometimes I get crap from some people. They think it's very, you know, well, look at me putting that stuff out there. But the reason I do it is because one, I like, I like seeing the progress. And then two, that's how I got started. I saw a bunch of my wrestling friends just getting jacked, guys who were heavy, losing weight. And I just said, if they can do it, I can do it, you know? So. Dude, haters going to hate. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's true. Isn't that funny too? You know, I I had a friend tell me one time, he said, uh, you you know, you're never going to get hate from somebody who's doing better than you. (laughs) You know, it's, and so. I think that that's kind of true. And so, um, so I just say, that's fine. You can hate all you want. I'm just going to do me and I do it for me anyway. Yeah. Well, I had a buddy the other day who, um, he posted in uh, or October of last year, he got into like, I mean, he's been, he's been in MMA, MMA forever, but he posted mm-hmm. a picture of him with a shirt off and it said 205. And mm-hmm. then most recently he's just like shredded at 175 and he also posted his um his weight like a graph of his weight like throughout the months you know and yeah. went all the way down and i was like and and i mean it inspired me i was like if dave can do it then i can like you know get yeah. on that you know because like um i gained I gained, I gained some weight when i was in minnesota and i've been kind of like trying to, when i hit 40 man like losing the weight has been tough i've been kind of hovering <laughs> around like 200 205 forever I'm trying to get down to like 190, 180, something like that. And, um, you know, and you just have to, I mean, it's an everyday thing, you know, you can't yeah. take, you can't take time off, you know? Yeah. And that's the problem. The problem with that, especially with the diet stuff is you could be good for a month and then be bad for a week and lose it all. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it, it's so easy to get off the wagon. It's just all discipline. And, um, you know, I mean, it's it's a struggle, especially as you get older. I mean, yeah, you it has to be a lifestyle switch. I mean, it has to be something where you're eating for fuel and not for fun. And unfortunately, so we're just social eaters. You know what I mean? We it's it's just a thing to go out 
And I've seen some of your stuff. You seem kind of like a foodie too. You kind of like going out and eating, eating nice things with your wife and stuff like that. Oh yeah. When we were, when we lived in Chicago, we had a thing where we had to go eat at every single Michelin restaurant in Chicago. And that was like 30 plus, you know? And so yeah. we, we were eaters. We liked to yeah. eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so with the brain injury stuff, if you had somebody, if someone's listening who knows someone or had someone uh, um, who had just had a concussion and was having some struggles, what would be some of the kind of basic things you would recommend they do um, to kind of help themselves heal? Uh, I mean, it depends on how bad it is. If it's pretty bad, um, you got to do some brain rest. You got to, I mean, you got to unplug. I wouldn't um, worry too much about being too productive, you know, like rest your head, try to get away from stress, that kind of thing. Um, there are certain um, um, physical therapy groups and chiropractic groups that have a traumatic brain injury rehab where they work on things like attention and they work on things like um, um, balance issues, that kind of thing. Sleep's usually really hard when um, initially. And so yeah. sometimes we might, pre I mean, if it's bad and you're not sleeping at all, then you pro it's probably a good idea to get on some meds, you know, or something. Um, um, but, um, and if there's attention issues, then you might need a stimulant, you know, it, it really just depends on kind of what the issues are. But if it persists, um, I mean, often people do have, do get depressed. And so, um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a like medicine guy. I think it kind of sounds like it from us talking, but like, I'm not, I'm not a medicine guy, but I'm a pro, kind of a pro health guy. But, mm -hmm. um, if you obviously need a medicine, then, you know, try the medicine and try it right. Mm -hmm. Like take it right and do it with somebody who knows what they're talking about. So that way, um, your, your life's sweet. In my opinion, it's not a good idea to let your, your life um, tank um, because of pain or because of a TBI or whatever, a traumatic brain injury, a concussion or whatever. Um, you really need a good coach to help you through that. And when I say coach, I'm talking about a physician um, that really help you through that. So that way you kind of know what to expect, because um, if you know what to expect, then it's a lot, then you're going to be a little bit more graceful on yourself that, okay, I, I can't, I can't, um, find the words or I can't sleep very well, but that's okay. Cause it's been, you know, a week and it was a pretty bad one. And, you know, so-and-so Dr. Massey, whoever said that I could expect that also with jobs. So one of the issues with mild traumatic brain injuries is uh, I'll see a lot of highly productive people, whether it's an attorney or, or a physician or anybody, you know, and they'll come in and, I mean, they're used to they're used to being on top of things. They're used to being sharp, and they also um, want to make sure that they maintain that income. And they get very stressed out about that. And sometimes, I say, and I try to, and you know, I try to do shared decision making. I don't. I try not to tell them what to do, but unless I have to. But I try to say, okay, it's probably a good idea if you hold if you take some time off, like a month, you know, or whatever. And um, Sometimes they listen to me and they do that. And, and sometimes they don't. And I'm telling you right now, when they don't and they go back to work, I will, I will prep them and say, you're going to get really upset, by the way, when you, when you go back to work, if you go back to work. And I said, well, we'll see what happens. And um, they go back to work. They have to go home. And, and yes, they, they're very upset. They, they start to think my life is over. You know, I'm never going to be able to function in this ever again. But, you know, the good news is there's lots of different things you can do you know, to help with, uh, with brain injuries. There's certain types of, um, glasses you can get to help. Um, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's certain meds, there's, there's, you know, rehab therapies. There's, there's a lot of stuff. So there, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the future when something like that happens. Yes, it probably is something that needs to be managed, you know, but, um, it doesn't mean that your, your life's over. You, you know, there, I know lots of people that have, the um that have concussive syndromes that actually kind of persist you know when they mm -hmm. should be better but mm -hmm. um you know they just learn how to manage it and they still have a sweet life you know yeah and that's the thing you know i i i'm convinced that i probably prolonged prolonged my recovery by not listening to <laughs> you know the therapists and the doctors who were telling me what to do i did i took i took some time off and you know i went it, it's so hard 
when you're good. I mean, I was working 60, 70 hours a week and went oh, to wow. zero. Right? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And so you're like, I was get the going, breaks. <laughs> yeah, I was going crazy. You know what I mean? It, yeah. and, and so I finally, I went to the doctor and I said, I don't care what you've got to do. Do whatever you got to do to get me back to work. I'm going insane. And I'm making everybody at my house crazy. You know what I mean? Sure. And and so they, they let me go back and it was just like four hours a day, two days a week. And even that was a struggle at first, you know? I mean, just trying to do little things like that to, to bring me back. But I think that was what's the most important thing to remember as someone who's had one is that, uh, you know, when you're when you're especially when you're someone who's highly effective and you're somebody who's maybe been an athlete, played sports, you know, you play through pain, right? You know, you're sick, you go to work anyway. You bet. You know, you play you play sports. You roll your ankle. You still you tape it up and you play. You know, we're kind of rewarded for pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, but you can't do that with a brain injury. I mean, you can't yeah. work through it like that. So. Right. Should probably mention kind of getting back to my disc. So when I had my disc in. Uh, uh, when I was 16, there was a recurrence when I was 20 and then another one when I was 25 and each oh, time geez. it happened again, it, I knew like I felt it coming on and I knew, and I'm, when I was 20, I was playing basketball and I was like, I need to stop, but we're playing, you know? And so I yeah. wanted to finish the game, you know? And so I, you know, I, I was playing and then it, it went and I collapsed and it was bad and it was bad. Like I was actually on my mission in Ireland. And at the time I was like, I don't know if I could finish, man. You know, like it was, it was yeah. bad. I did finish there. But, um, and then when I was 25, same thing. Um, I was, I think I was like lifting or something and I felt it coming on. I would just say if like you've had disc injuries um, and you feel it coming on, you need to stop. You need to pay. Yeah. You, you just need to stop and, and, you know, resume. And that's, that's hard when you're playing a sport or whatever, but you got to do it. I remember when I was down, I would, um, I would think, what do people do that don't play sports? I mean, <laughs> what do they, what do they do? Like yeah. watch movies and read, you know, like it's so <laughs> yeah. boring, you know, and, um, it was awful and, and you're right. It does something to your psyche, you know? So it was just, it was just bad, but, um, but yeah, with brain injury and with brain injury, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, people that concussions, you got to go easy on yourself. It's okay. You're injured, you know? And yeah. so you can't expect to be full tilt if like, uh, especially if it's been within three months, you know, like you got to give yeah. yourself some time to heal and um, really have that mindset that you are healing and yeah. um, you got to give your, your brain a break. And everybody knows what that means. That's, you know, that's reading, probably scrolling social media is probably not the best thing to do, you know, like, um, you know, even just people, like if somebody's like overwhelming you, then you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take some time away from that person, you know? Oh, it, it, was, you know? it was even hard. I remember there was a time where I went to a restaurant, kind of like a, like a Texas roadhouse type of restaurant. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, you know, I was there with my kids and it was just loud and you, it was so hard to focus because there were so many conversations going on and there was the music going on and the people dancing over here. You know, they have the way the, the servers dance sometimes and stuff. And I just, I was like, I gotta get out of here. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. it, it was just, it was overwhelming and fatiguing. And that's, a, that's another thing about the brain injury that's so hard is the fatigue. I mean, you just get so tired so fast. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but I remember, I remember they told me it's hard to, it's so hard to, because if you get a day uh, where you're feeling good and you're feeling kind of normal, I would have a few of those days, right? Where I would feel normal and I'd be like, this is great. And I'd get on a roll and I was only supposed to work six hours, but I pushed through to eight. And then the next day it was just like, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Just right back down. And then that's when they told me, they're like, you got to stop doing this. You know what I mean? Like you have to, you 70 percent and then that's it just that's a good day and when i finally started listening it got better you know uh, yeah. I, I can't emphasize enough to listen to your doctors when they're telling you what to do and uh, they know what they're talking about if you have a good one yeah well i, I like how you brought up when uh, what to do when you're feeling better so i would see patients that when they feel better um and, I, and it sounds like it's similar to you they, they wanted to go back to work full time they, they would they just wanted to go back they, i'm good I want you to sign off. And I would, again, say, hey, listen, I think you should go back for half a day every other day, you know, like mm -hmm. try it out first before you go back full tilt, because um, 
you're going to find that your endurance isn't there, you know, and maybe mm-hmm. like you're good with um, um, attention, you're good with processing now, like in the moment, but you know, throughout the day, I mean, you can just get overwhelmed. And so it's just like training your body, you know, you got to train your brain, you got to slowly ease into it, you know, and um, just kind of acknowledge where you're, um, where you're at, you know, and I find that when people do that, and they go back to work for maybe a limit of four hours every other day, that uh, that's, that's, for me, has been a pretty good strategy with patients, as opposed to, Let's just go back to work. Yeah, no, I I agree. That's exactly what they did to me. When I came in there, I was like, I don't care what you got to do. Do whatever you got to do, but get me back to work. And that's all they'd give me. They gave me two days a week, four hours a day, Tuesday and Thursday. And they're like, and if you can do that, we'll go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then if you can do that, we'll go up. And then once we got three full days, we'll add a fourth, you know. So it was a slow, slow row, row through it. Um, and luckily, you know, my, my boss, my friend, I, ca- I can't say enough how much support I had here. I mean, it's easy. I think it's a little bit easier because we deal with so many brain injuries. They, they get it, right? right. Um, and so that made it a little bit easier. But, yeah, you know, the, they're no joke. And so um, so same thing with, you know, spine injuries. It sounds like you're, you're telling us the same thing. You know, if you have a spine injury, uh, don't be a hero you know, work through it, you're injured. Right. Particularly if um, you do heavy labor, you don't want to be a hero. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, slinging, you know, wood, or if you're on a construction site and you have an acute disc herniation, um, they ask me, can you make it worse? And the answer is yes, you can make it worse. (laughs) And so, um, you know, you just got to work well with your physical therapist or your chiropractor to kind of see where you're at. And then, you know, go back in a, in a graded fashion as opposed to going from like 20% to like 100% and slowly start to, you know, do more things, do light duty, do what you got to do to slowly get in. You know, um, I would say if you do take time off, like if you are do, um, if you take like maybe, you know, two months off or something like that, um, don't just uh, hang out and watch Netflix. You need to make sure that you're actively, um, involved in some sort of rehab work conditioning or work hardening program to make it so you're ready to go when it's time. Mm, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, so tell me, you know, we, what's next for, for Dr. Massey? Uh, well, I'm, uh, right now focused on building the, uh, the clinics and, uh, building up the, uh, medical life care planning, um, uh, business. So, um, where I'm at right now is, um, talk to a local hospital and we're seeing if there's any opportunities for a joint venture. And, uh, what I'd like to do, like I said, eventually the, the five-year plan is to get clinics all up and down the Gulf coast where we um, do in-house procedures, um, in-house drug monitoring and treatment. Um, you know, working with systems, working with uh, supporting surgeons um, on the front end and back end for patients that are going in for surgery. Um, We, uh, you know, for medical uh, life care planning for MedLCP, um, the website is almost done. Um, Oh, hold on a second, man. My uh, my thing's about to tank. Hold on one sec. Okay. Need some juice. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, better. Yeah, I almost, I almost there lost the thing. Okay. Um, yeah, but I haven't really marketed um, the Med LCP um, uh, business. I've worked primarily with two attorneys out here for that, and um, I feel like I have the system down pretty well. And I wanted to make sure that that was good before I just, um, you know, just offered it, you know, mm-hmm. to everybody. But um, I do think it's a great skill for physiatrists to have because we often get asked the crystal ball question, like, what is this person going to need the rest of their life? You know, and I get the papers all the time that they need me to fill out for an insurance company or something like that. And when you're not trained and what's one of the good things about life care planning is when I got trained to do that, um, I was able to confidently answer those questions as opposed to, I don't know. I mean, I think he might need PT. 
I don't know how long, you know? And so yeah. um, you get confident at providing opinions, you know, that you can defend and um, stand by. And so, um, you know, I've gotten involved with this um, group called IARP. It's the International Association of Rehabilitation Professionals. And I sit on the Florida board here for mm -hmm. um, training and education. Um, and so I'm, I'm up on kind of the latest when it comes to those types of issues. And, um, you know, I kind of wish I had some of that training like coming up because I'd be filling out paperwork and they, and and you have to fill it out. And I'm like, I don't I don't know. I, I, I don't know uh -huh. the answer to these questions. Um, but this has been very helpful for me to um, to fill out all the paperwork confidently and um, and, you know, being able to uh, understand what people are going to need for the future. Um, you know, we make a, I make a conscious effort to stay independent when doing that. But as a, um, as a doctor, if I'm not being a life care planner, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that my patient, my personal patient will get what they need, you know, in mm -hmm. the future. and so, cause often they don't, you know, mm -hmm. they, they don't often get that. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a shame. I have a buddy, um, I forget his name, but um, you might know him actually. He got in an accident and um, he's a brain injured um, patient. And I don't think he's got anything. I think he's just kind of um, living off of what the government will give him. And I think he's got like a few kids and um, he was a guy at DC. I forget his name. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just really sad, you know? Mm. So, so, so when patients get in or when people get into a car accident, um, I understand why um, attorneys would advocate for their patients to get a life care plan so that way they can understand the future medical requirements that are reasonable um, so that way they get what they need for the future. Well, yeah, and that's what's so important, too, is that, you know, it's it's an interesting system. I explain it to my, my clients all the time. We get one shot to prove that everything that you have done up until the date of trial was uh, that the collision was a substantial factor in causing the need for that treatment. And then we have to show everything that's ever going to happen that's reasonably certain to occur. Right. And, and it's like, you know, that's incredibly hard to do. And I try to explain to my clients often how important it is that they follow what their doctors say because they need to get to the point where someone like Dr. Massey can come in and say, yeah, we've done the, we've done the work that we know what's reasonably certain to occur. Cause if you, you know, you've mentioned on this podcast, a lot of the injections you do are just as much diagnostic as they are therapeutic. So you do it right. And then unless they've gone through that long enough, you, how are you going to know whether they need one or two injections or three injections a year for 10 years? You're not going to know that until you've done the work and seen that the injections actually going to work and for how long. And yeah. so, so that's why it's so important when you're when you've been in, in any injury really but especially in the line of when you have somebody who's been injured they in a car accident or in some sort of third party liability action that you know what that is so that you can be compensated for it right and you know when i'm doing a life care plan uh, most of the time i i rely only on uh, what their treating providers recommend but often, as you know, there, there's gaps, you know, like there's mm -hmm. obvious things that aren't included that um, need to be included. And so we'll try our best to like collaborate with them and do like a team conference or something to try to see, OK, what you know, what you know, what, what about this? For example, like if somebody mm -hmm. had a, a herniated disc. Should they get, you know, imaging every few years? And the answer is yes. You know, and so it's yeah. kind of like how often and so, you know, but it's not included, you know, so you got to make sure that it's. It's there. It's one of the benefits of being a physician life care planner is that we can actually diagnose and a lot of and we can and, I, and as a physiatrist, as a PM&R doctor, you actually see these patients in the long run. And so mm -hmm. um, our opinions are reliable when it comes to that. And, um, mm -hmm. and it's reasonable. There are some guys out there that will say they need everything. You know, they need something, yeah. you know, every single, you know, they need injections every month or whatever. And. I'll see life care plans too um, and do a rebuttal, you know, if needed, you know, kind of thing and say, hey, is this, is this, is this right? And I was like, nah, that's a little extra. Um, I think yeah. that, uh, they, they're kind of shooting for the stars there. It's not very reasonable, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and you can probably wait on this. That that's that could really hurt a case, right? If like somebody just asks for everything and a life care plan is padded and they just put everything in there. Oh, yeah. And that, it, it, it's possible. It, it really can be. And and look, you know, it, it, it depends on the 
the provider. Like I've often said to some uh, some people that, you know, I don't want the doctor who's a quick, you know, quick to send someone to surgery or I don't want the doctor who, you know, I don't want the life care planner that adds everything in. Because like you said, I mean, it's 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 not reasonable. I like I like doctors who have who work both for plaintiffs and the defense, quite frankly, because they seem they have more credibility, you know. Um, right. And so I I appreciate that when it's it is reasonable and it is something that is actionable. You know, it's something that you that I remember one time going to a trial and there was this woman and she was she was she was. Uh, pretty bad off, and they had a a, a PM and R doctor come in and do a life care plan, and he said, uh, "Doctor, you recommended, um, you know, this water therapy for this person. Do you even know if she knows how to swim? You know, and, and you know, just things like that, where it can right. really make you look kind of like, you know, you're just throwing everything at the wall and hoping something sticks. And right. So, so yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And so you now you're providing life care planning. Are you also costing out? The stuff? Yeah, we do. Yeah, I do the whole thing. Oh, okay. Wow. Awesome. All right. Well, great. Well, listen, let me ask you a couple of just personal questions. I ask everybody on these podcasts because it's, it's interesting. Like I said, it just, it, it blows my mind where, you know, everybody ends up like some of my friends are engineers and PhDs and, you know, doctors, lawyers. It's so interesting how everybody, you know, we, we had a good group that really ended up doing really good, really well for themselves. Um, a lot of attorneys in Sacramento now, right? What's that? There's a lot of attorneys in Sacramento from the group we came up with. So many, yeah. A lot of them went to defense. You know, a lot of them, okay. a lot of them did defense. But yeah, um, not there are a few of us uh, that are not really from our group that are that are plaintiffs guys. Um, most of them, you know, they've gone into other fields. A lot of estate planners, you know. Okay. Because um, I, I mean, I think personally, I think that that. That leads leads more to the uh, work life balance that that you would get in a traditional forty hour week job. Not a lot of litigation going on in that, and so. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, being a trial attorney is it's rough. It's it's rough on the home life because you're just. I mean, I've I've spent a month in beautiful Merced. You know what I mean? I've spent a, <laughs> I've spent a month in that. You know, t- trying to case in Napa five days a week, and I'm home for a day and a half, and I'm back out. You know. So it's it's um, it's a little bit tougher, and you're you know, these clients are. I take great pride in what I do because my clients, a lot of them, they like I I've had clients who they can't work anymore, and I had a client one time who was literally at the time the case resolved was living in a trailer, on a friend's property because he couldn't work, and he didn't know what to do, and luckily we were able to make give him. Get him enough of a resolution that he's not going to need to live in a trailer anymore. Um, so I, you know, there's a lot of sleepless nights because you're you're scared. You know, these people have their whole lives in your hands. It's 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 a so it makes you it compels you to work a little bit more. You know what I mean? Right. To help these guys. So, um, but but the, some of the personal questions I ask everybody on these podcasts: um, What would you say is your biggest success in life? Hmm. Well, I'd say uh, my marriage has been the biggest success of my life. So my, my wife has been uh, with me through thick and thin. Um, she helped me with uh, the, <laughs> the scramble issue was, was a tough one. I can't, I can't tell you the, uh, the emotions I had when I didn't match into a program out of med school. Mm-hmm. That's every med student's uh, nightmare. And mm-hmm. um she had a cool head and helped me work through that. Um, uh, she's been very supportive on uh, my career, just moving wherever. I mean, she didn't think in a million years she'd move, live in Minnesota. And um, I don't know if you've ever been, but Minnesota's cold. Like, yeah. uh, I did a depot there once. It, I didn't want to go back. <laughs> it, it was like negative 50. I'm driving home and I'm thinking if I break down, I'm probably going to die, you know, like if I can't, if I can't like get somebody over here in time or whatever, you know, right. So, um, you know, great people there, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, the weather's rough. Um, but yeah, I mean, like my, I've been very blessed with, uh, my marriage, um, um, as you know, work, uh, 
I say just family. I mean, I mean, you know, my, you know, my family, like, you know, my dad, yeah. my dad's been uh, great. He's always been um, the same, you know, as far as um, who he is and what he represents, what he does, you know, and mm-hmm. um, he stayed pretty firm in that. Um, my brothers and sister, um, they're, they're great. Um, you know, I, I can't, I cannot complain about my family, man. Like I'm very, uh, I feel very blessed to have um, the family that I have and um, you know, um, and just, and just keeping that together. I think to me, the success is just keeping it together, you know, and just keeping yeah. it going, you know, um, you know, work-wise, um, you know, I, I always wanted to be a doctor. So that was huge for me, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like when I became a doctor, when I actually got board certified in pain, that was huge. Um, mm-hmm. that was like, uh, you know, that, that was great, you know? Yeah. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it's funny. You, you uh, because I think you had a you had a couple of close calls around marriages before, didn't you? You had a couple of people you were looking at, and so we're wondering who was who was going to be good enough to pin you down. And and it sounds like you got a good one there. So that that's great. How long have you been married? Uh, thirteen years. Thirteen. All right. Well, that's awesome. The so thirteen so, thirteen in uh, October. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So now next. Um, um, so last question I ask everybody. Um, one day we hope way in the future, but one day you're going to pass away. And there's going to be a funeral and someone's going to give you a eulogy. What would you want the one thing to be that they they say about you and your eulogy? Um, I would want them to say that um, I'm honest and I uh, say what I mean. Um, and um, I'm loyal. Awesome. Yeah, that's huge. Well, dude, I am so... I'm grateful for you reaching out and coming on the podcast and talking about this. This has been fun for me. It's fun to talk shop uh, on these yeah, types man. of things with somebody. And um, so, so tell us, uh, you said you, the website's up. What is the website? Uh, the website is um, medlcp.com. That's the website for um, the medical life care planning website. It's not, it's not completely done, but like the basics are there as terms of services and, um, yeah, there's a, uh, there's an email address there. If anybody's interested in, uh, in, uh, getting a life care plan or any services. Awesome. And do you offer those services across state lines? Is it just in Florida or is it anywhere? Oh yeah, I'll do it wherever. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Good mm-hmm. to know. Well, awesome. Well, well, Mike, it's been great. I really appreciate it. Let's keep in contact. We'll have to have you back uh, as you, as you go through your process and you get up and running we'll have you back and we'll talk about the process of, of putting your own business together and streamlining your, your, uh, you know, your, your business. So that'd be awesome. Cool, man. Appreciate it. And Hey man, we, I have, so I have a, I have a, I'm going to ask you if you would be a guest on my podcast at some point, it's called uh pain radio. And I, uh, I, I would love to pick the brain of a, uh, of a PI attorney on, on, uh, get, get a little more in depth in, uh, and your, your thoughts on pain and pain oh, medicine. Absolutely, man. I would do it anytime. You just tell me when and I'll be there. Sounds so, good, man. Awesome. Well, so, oh, I'm supposed to tell everybody again, if you've made, if you've made it this far, subscribe and uh, we'll catch you next time. All right.